Okay, so welcome. Uh, this will be a joint presentation. So first, uh, I will do a presentation talking about Sweden, and then we will have uh, Anna and Mikael do a presentation about the Finnish situation. Uh, so my name is Victor Järnelöv. I work for an organization called INERA, which in Sweden is a organization co-owned by the counties and the municipalities. Um, and that will be important, and I will tell you later why that's important. Um, so basically, Sweden, what is Sweden? Well, Sweden is... Uh, it's a large country up north with uh, not so many people living in it. Um, we consist or we're organized uh, such as we have 290 different municipalities and we have 21 different regions. And the regions have a high degree of uh, self-autonomy. And they also have the right to sort of tax their citizens and they have the right to decide how to organize and perform the um, the tasks that the state has told them to do. Uh, and one of those things is to provide health care to the citizens in Sweden. Uh, Sweden is also a country where the population, uh, we as just as the rest of the European or the rest of the world, I guess, or most of the world, people get older and uh, older people tend to live longer. Well, that's sort of part of the definition of being older. Uh, and but they also consume healthcare, and healthcare is, well, it, it gets uh, more expensive. Uh, so the challenges that we have in Sweden, or actually the counties, or what they have is that they, uh, we have this demographic curve. And again, this is not something that's unique to Sweden. A lot of countries have the same problem, where the post-World War II generation are moving from healthy, uh, working sort of uh, part of the population to becoming a more elderly, um, retired part. So they don't contribute with tax money anymore. Uh, we have a sort of complicated economical situation in a lot of the regions. This year, only two of them will actually uh, make their budget in terms of healthcare. So we have a challenging situation and the trend shows that it's only get worse uh, as time goes by. So what do we do about this? Well, of course, we need to overhaul the whole healthcare system. And again, this is not something that's unique to Sweden. Uh, I think most organizations or most countries uh, try to find ways of making their organization uh, more efficient. Uh, and we, so we, we have a bunch of inquiries and reports and, and uh, different studies that all have pointed to more or less these different ways of of trying to, to address the problem that we're facing. So you want to engage the patients more. Uh, you want to make sure that the patients get the sort of right level of treatment, life, the right level of, of health care. Um, you want also to make sure that collaboration across different kinds of organization um, improves so that you can make sure that the patient actually sort of gets transitioned in the system in the correct way. And of course, you also new, need new legislation to make sure that all of this is legal because uh, today legislation is also a big problem in terms of, of uh, making this happen in Sweden. And the regions, like we said, since they have a lot of power in deciding how they want to, to sort of offer healthcare to the citizens, they have also realized that there are a lot of things that they want to do uh, together. They, they have uh, joint needs. So they want to coordinate and collaborate uh, on things that they want to solve together. And that's what the organization I'm working for do. We help the regions solve their common uh, needs in terms of basically interoperability in healthcare. Uh, so anyway, all these uh, all these solution items here, bullets, uh, they basically 
point to this. We need to be better at sharing information in order for us to have uh, at least a little chance of, of solving the, the, the problem that we have. Um, and this means that we need to make sure that the patient, of course, gets to be more involved in their healthcare. They need to have access. They need to be able to contribute their data. They need to make sure that they understand where in the pro process they are and where to go next and so on. Again, this is not something that's unique to Sweden, but it's the situation we have. Sweden is also a country that uh, where, where we had a, a national architecture and infrastructure in place for interoperability for the better half of, of almost two decades now. Well, not two decades, a decade and a half, I would say. Uh, and I guess this is what makes us a little bit different because to us, fire is not something that sort of makes it possible to share, share information. It's just another way of sharing information. So um, I don't know how many of you heard the, the keynote speaker today. and uh, She talked about the, uh, the app they have where they can basically gather all the information that the patient in Canada has from different care providers and show it in an app. Uh, in Sweden, we had that national service for seven years. Uh, and it's not something we really think about. But the infrastructure that we have in Sweden is something that enables that. And that infrastructure is based on a couple of, I guess, architectural principles or something. It's, it's a service-oriented architecture in the background. Um, we have the concepts of loose coupling. Since there are too many consumers and producers out there, you need out of necessity to keep them separated from each other, so you don't need to actually be tightly connected. We have the concept of business addressing, because in Sweden, um, the sort of org organizational connection to a, a actual system is, it's not one-to-one, -one, so to say. We have a, a quite a fluid um, way of organizing our healthcare, and the system implementations are um, they're quite static, so you don't automatically know where, which system to address if you want to address a specific healthcare uh, unit. And the healthcare organization also changes a lot, so. Uh, aggregating services is also something that, um, due to the complexity of the ecosystem, we have uh, found suitable to offer. And this is the aggregating services are what the uh, our the national patient portal, I guess, or the, the equivalent of the application that the keynote speaker uh, brought up, they use this, so they only make one request to one place, and then there's infrastructure in the background that allows the aggregating service to sort of more or less vacuum the whole country for patient data, and then it returns it to the consumer. Um, and behind the aggregating service concept, we have the service discovery functionality that allows us to understand how and where to sort of pass the requests on to. So we actually manage to find the endpoints that hold the data that, that we're interested in. We also have a sort of well-defined payloads. W I guess what this means is that we have separate service contracts for different or specific uh, I guess business objects. So we have one for diagnosis, we have one specific for lab results, we have one specific pa for patient records and so on. So we have a, a couple of those uh, and these, they're not the only ones we have, uh, but they, they are the ones that are mostly used. So I guess, I mean, this th and this is just one way for us to solve the problems that we had uh, five, ten years ago. Uh, so again, this the whole sort of situation will be the same in the future as well, but even more difficult. So then why are we looking at fire? I guess it all comes down to the first point, because it's a way for us to hopefully save money, because that's what we need. If we don't save money, we're, we're not going to be <laughs> a good country to live in in a couple of decades. Uh, and we all want to live in a good country. So. Um, all the rest, they're just sort of 
ways of of uh, of making fire or they are what makes fire a potential to save money so if if uh, if fire wasn't industry adopted it wouldn't be sort of very uh, interesting for the regions because the regions since we're a small country they want to have a sort of large selection of applications that they can use to sort of enforce or enhance their um, their businesses with and I mean, since we're such a small country, no app developer is going to be interested in coming and, and develop a specific little app for our way of communicating data that we have defined in our own way. So standardization is, is very, very central to our hopes of, of uh, becoming more um, money efficient, so to say. Uh, so what we've been doing at INERA is we've been looking at ways of realizing or translating the architectural principles uh, or concepts that we have in place today, but using fire technology to do it instead. And I will not go into details about all this, but the, this, the concepts are the same. Um, we try to achieve loose coupling. We need to have ways of uh, enabling business addressing. Uh, we need to offer the concept of aggregating services somehow. Um, we need the whole service discovery thing to work the way it does, more or less conceptually at least. And we need to have well-defined payloads so that we can know what information is being transferred when. Uh, and we need ways to decide what this information, or describe what this information is. Now, the FIRE standard, it offers a lot of ways that you can solve these problems with. Uh, so we can more or less use the standard as it is uh, and sort of puzzle together a way of doing this the Swedish way. And we can tell everyone that, well, we're compliant, we're use, we follow the standard, and this is the FIRE way of, of solving Swedish architectural needs. But that's not going to solve the problem because if we do it our way, and then you can take, for instance, uh, the Netherlands, they have the same standard that they're using, FIRE, but their whole infrastructure, they, they solve, the, for instance, the concept of aggregating services in a different way than we do, but they're all according to the standard because the standard just gives you pieces of the puzzle so you can play with it, uh, then that means that an app that's developed for the Dutch market won't be interoperable on the Swedish market. So our conclusion is this. Um, the standard it in itself, in its at least the current specification of it, is by itself not enough uh, to satisfy the region's requirements that we have. So what we're looking at is we're trying to find ways of standardizing things together with other countries that the standard itself does not address, such as different architectural patterns for realizing some of these concepts and others. So I guess what we're trying to understand is how and where and who should we talk to to, to get that going. And I know there will be a little birds of a feather session tomorrow uh, afternoon where this will be spoken about, but I don't feel like, yes, we're, we're sort of just trying to reach out here. Uh, so <laughs> if any of you uh, know anyone or any sort of, maybe you're one yourself who works with similar kinds of questions uh, somewhere, then uh, please reach out to us and we'll be very happy to talk to you. I think that's it. Now we're gonna uh, hand over the mic to our Finnish neighbors. Uh, do we have time? Okay. Do we have Do we have questions? Okay, one finished question. Yes. So the question is: uh, Can a citizen in Sweden access their own data and download it and play with it? Uh, the answer to that question is no. 
You can't access your own data. You can look at it, but you can't access it. So we have a, a patient-faced window to your whole, more or less, uh, electronic health record, but you can only look at it. You can't use it. You can't, there's no patient health record in Sweden. I'm guessing you have something to say about patient health records. Well, we have personal health record ah, in Finland, personal. and that's for the patient-generated health data, and that works differently. But for clinical data, we have, unfortunately, the same situation as you. Wow. We can yeah. watch it, but not touch it. Right. <laughs> Anything else? Well, you're all very, very well polite and so on. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Hey, so yes, uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Korpula, and I'm across from Finland. And I currently um, work for a um, governmental agency in Finland called Kela. And um, um, the organization is responsible for the um, technical implementation and development of uh, the Finnish national centralized e-health infrastructure called Kanta Services. And um, currently I'm working as the product owner of one of our new Kanta services called Kanta Personal Health Record, uh, which is actually um, the first Kanta service that is uh, based on fire standard. And um, um, that's actually um, what we're going to talk to do you today uh, a lot about. And I also have uh, Mikael here with me, so if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Mikael Rinsmaki from a healthcare startup called Sensotrend. Uh, yes, and, and we're here to give you um, um, some insights into the use of fire in Finland. And, and like I said, we'll focus mostly on contact personal health record. I'll first talk to you about what, is, what it actually is and how we're using fire there. And Mikael will tell you about some experiences integrating to this fire-based platform. And then in the end, we'll, uh, we'll give you some uh, brief um, um, presentations to, to or short presentations to other use cases of fire in Finland as well just to show you what we're doing, and, and if you're interested in, in those as well, uh, we'll connect you with the right people to talk to more about. Yes, but let's start with a short introduction to what Kanta Personal Health Record actually is. So it's a national uh, centralized data repository for um, people's own health and well-being data. And, and here we mean uh, data that's actually patient-generated or, or generated by people at home uh, during their everyday lives, uh, um, where they may have any all kinds of personal measurement devices. So, so they may measure their blood pr pressure or blood glucose at home or, or have all kinds of fitness um, uh, bracelets or, or the activity bands uh, where you can follow up on your activities and, and so forth. So, so for that kind of data, this is a data repository for. We do have um, also data repositories in Finland for official medical data, but this is not the one. We have different repositories for that, where that data gets stored into that's generated in, in hospitals and by doctors during um, care processes, and also from uh, social services as well. Um, so nationally, we are offering the platform itself, um, and it's used by these um, third-party apps that have been integrated into the platform. So, so the idea is that nationally, we don't develop these um, applications with which people actually use the platform, um, but basically any software developer, any app developer developing these kinds of health and well-being um, apps, uh, where whether it's devices or apps where people can type in uh, health and well-being related data, um, they can get their um, app integrated um, to this platform. And, and the idea with Counter Personal Health Record is that in addition to uh, the data that the app uh, itself produces and stores to Counter PHR, they can also get access to data produced by other apps as well that has been stored in the Counter PHR platform. So, so the idea is that we would get um, innovative and, and empowering um, apps uh, to be built on top of all that data that's available in kind of personal health record. And this is something that we already have up and running in Finland for about a year now. Um, and, and in the future, uh, we'll also enable people to share the data that they stored in this personal health record uh, to their social and care providers to be for that data to be utilized uh, as part of their care and, and any social services that they're, they're going to have in the future. Uh, so that's a very short introduction uh, 
to what the Canto PHR as a service uh, actually is. And, and um, now we'll shift towards more fire specific um, um, things uh, from now on. So, so I'd like to first talk to you about our national data content uh, that we have for Canto PHR. So here we mean a set of uh, data content and fire profiles that we nationally agree upon that uh, uh, is data content that can be stored to kind of personal health record and also the fire profiles that they are um, correct and applicable to be used uh, in kind of personal health record. And, and we do um, require all apps um, to declare conformance to a profile when they're storing data and we also use the profiles to actually validate all incoming data to the platform to um, ensure correctness of data. Um, so, because we are, um, of course, uh, anytime welcoming uh, new applications who want to probably st start storing new kinds of data to this platform, we continuously need to develop our data content. And for that, we have a sort of an open development process uh, where anyone can suggest new data content and new fire profiles um, uh, that we should be able to implement and support um, in the platform. And for, for reviewing the suggestions, we have this sort of a development uh, community around it where um, there's repre representatives from my organization and we're um, responsible for sort of the technical reviewing of the data content and the fire profiles that um, maybe app developers or someone else suggests. Um, then we have repre representatives from the National Institute of Health and Welfare in Finland, and they're bringing in the clinical expertise and, and review those data contents from the clinical perspective. Um, then there's HL Summer Finland Association, um, who's responsible for facilitating parts of the process. And, and of course, there's app developers and other experts, and basically anyone who's who's interested in, in developing these kinds of data content. So it's a totally open process and, and we have open Skype meetings um, once a month um, where anybody can, can come in and, and, and participate in, in reviewing the data contents that are just uh, suggested to us. There are some challenges we faced uh, with this development process. So, so if you're think thinking about something, um, something like this or, or have, have something like this in your your implementations, um, maybe you should pay attention to. Um, unfortunately, we have noticed that the process is not fast enough, so the expectations and, and the real reality uh, don't meet at the moment. Uh, so the expectations of app developers suggesting new data content, they want it to be really quick and, and you know have to go through the process and actually accept the data content so we can move on to actually integrating um, but unfortunately, that's not the reality. It, it currently does take um, quite a lot of time and, and to actually get uh, data content accepted there. But it's something we're paying attention to and trying to currently rethink the process uh, about how to, how to make it more fast. And, and one of the reasons for it not being fast is, is uh, that we don't, in the beginning, get enough information about the data content to actually properly review it. So if we get a fire profile, and a very short description, a use case description. It's, it's very difficult, both from the clinical and the technical perspective, to actually review the data content. So then we have to ask more for more information and, and it starts take, take, taking time. So that's one of the reasons. Uh, then another unfortunate thing is that uh, currently there is not, in, not a proper development community built around this. So, so we do have participants in our Skype meetings, but, but they're more in the listening mode. So they are there and they listen, but, but they don't actively um, uh, give feedback or review the, the um, data content. So, so we do it mainly by my organization, Gala, and, and the National Institute of Health and Welfare. But we're hoping for, for to, to get a bigger community around it to, to contribute to this. But, but we'll make, make some, some efforts to be able to, to do that. Uh, okay, then the, our uh, fire profiles, you can find them in Simplifier. Just a sh short slide about that. We have both STU3 and R4 profiles, so please go check them out. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can also see um, some of the resource types we're supporting in Canto PHR and, and some details as well about, about the profiles that we have related to those resource types. So if you're doing anything uh, similar, please be in touch and, and let's see if we can collaborate on, on some things. 
Uh, but there are four profiles. Just wanted to say that they are draft ones because we're still um, building our R4 support for the platform. So, so we're still developing those profiles and, and probably will, they will change, change um, to some extent still. Okay, then a little, a few words about profiling uh, because <coughs> it's been a learning process for us uh, related to a pro uh, profiling approaches and, and I just want to um, bring this out to you so that if you're starting to think about something similar then you may want to consider uh, some points before making the decision of which way to start profiling. So we started off with closed profiling approach and you can see some justifications for that decision that probably have been um, presented in, in previous dev days uh, materials as well. Um, but with the growth profiling, we did uh, receive feedback that it is not ideal for software developers, for the app developers, uh, that we use the growth profiling because it's making their lives a lot harder uh, because we're um, planning so many uh, restrictions and constraints to the incoming data that it makes their life harder to actually integrate to, to our platform. So, so with our four, we're shifting towards a more open <coughs> profiling um, manner. And actually, I went to Lloyd's uh, presentation yesterday about fire architecture design. If you weren't there, watch it afterwards when we get the material. It was a good one, and, and we're going to take some important points home from there and, and, and rethink of, of our profiling manners even once more. OK, uh, then about R4 and building support for it. So there's a very, very simple picture related to our plan, but, but what we're planning to do is to build up a um, separate R4 endpoint next to our current existing SU3 endpoint, and we'll have a single uh, fire data repository, and, and then apps as, as they can start building R4 um, support for their apps, uh, they can start using the R4 endpoint, and, and um, uh, the idea is that storing resources, we store the resources as they are. So if you store as the U3 resources, we store it as it is, and R4 resources as R4 resources, and they'll coexist in the same uh, data repository. But for searching, um, we're going to build up converters so that uh, if you're using the STU3 endpoint, you'll only get STU3 STU resources from that endpoint, so we'll on the fly convert any R4 resources that should be returned to an stu 3 app so that they get only stu 3 resources and the same thing for, for the R4 endpoint. And then after a transition period, we'll drop uh, the stu 3 endpoint and the stu 3 support, and, and at that point, we'll convert all existing stu 3 resources to R4 resources, and, and then we can forget about stu 3 after that. Yes, now I'll hand over to Mikael so he can tell you something about experience, please. Don't need that. Ah, sorry. Just <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to boost the uptake of this Kanta PHR, the ministry almost exactly two years ago launched a design contest searching for ideas from app developers who come up with clever ideas what to use this PHR for. We are developing tools for people with type 1 diabetes, and it's a high data-driven condition, and all the data is patient-generated. So glucose meter, meters and continuous glucose monitors, insulin pumps, we need all that data. And what SensorTrend does is combine that data with all these wellness trackers. So we entered with one, one entry of that, and then another entry related to open source development community produced apps for type 1 diabetes. And we won with this later entry, one of the three categories. So Night Scout is an open source development community with around 50,000 members all around the globe, more than 1,000 in Finland. And they make all kind of hacked versions of type 1 diabetes treatment data. And currently, it works so that, that each family, for instance, needs to author their own server implementation in Azure or Heroku or whatever server part, and then they compile their apps and run them on their mobile phones or smartwatches. And we make it now a bit easier to, so we take the server part and host that on top of Kanta PHR, so all the data flows in. 
That's in Finnish currently, but the way it works, you sign in, there's a strong authentication provided by the Kanta PHR, so you can use your bank credentials or mobile operators, mobile authorization. You get to the platform, it asks, okay, this Night Scout FI service wants to access your account in this Kanta PHR. You click OK, hopefully. And after that, you get this kind of API secret that's demanded by the Night Scout apps. And that's something that you can then feed into your apps. And after that, the data starts flowing. And then you can see it in the officially supported Conta PHR. And when you take a closer look, you can see that, for instance, this, was, this measurement was entered by XDRIP application through our Night Scout Connect service. And that's really transformative and empowering for this development community that we finally get a step closer to the official regulated healthcare. So this API we are developing as a regulated CE marked medical device. However, the devices out there, the apps connecting to that don't need to be medical devices. So also the Kanta PHR is not a medical device, as I understood. Then another point of this Kanta PHR is the way it allows different companies to work together. So SensorTrend's main service is, as I mentioned, providing this kind of actionable insights or visualizations about all the data. So that's the ambulatory glucose profile showing two weeks of my glucose data, the vari variations there. And then you can take a closer look per each day and you can see the measurement from our continuous glucose monitor, and then we have additional information here saying, okay, here are estimated to eat a breakfast of 70 carbs, and he have cycled and played soccer, and all of the data that we get from different apps and devices. And one app is Meal Logger, and they won another category in this design competition. So they are now feeding the Kanta PHR with nutrition data, both images and then the nutritional content. So there's an AI-backed service. You take a photo of your meal and then it proposes that, okay, I think there's minestrone soup or minced meat soup here and a side salad and a bread roll. And then I, as a user, confirm that, yes, there is this. So it doesn't tell me the nutritional content straight away. It just proposes, okay, I see these things, and then I confirm them. After that, it calculates me the nutritional value. And we have worked with Milogger before, and we can, of course, collaborate with them, make a bilateral agreement. But we think that this kind of a platform, bringing all the data together, is much easier for the consumers then they don't need to remember each of the services where they have said, yes, okay, you can access my data and you can share my data with this company. Right? All that consent management is done on the Kanta PHR. And we like these my data principles that the patient is in the center. You can fetch data from many different sources and essentially all of that is at some point health data. So we are trying to work by that And the main outcome from our integrations with Kanta PHR is really this feedback that we get from our users that this is really transformative to see the data from this open source development community being brought together to the official healthcare system. It's taken a long time, Anna said, so we anticipated that but it's been two years and we are still not live. We feel that we've fulfilled all the requirements and then they come up with new re requirements. <laughs> <laughs> but so it is in healthcare and we are still patient and going on. I would say the absolute biggest problem currently with Kanta PHR is the lack of attention to business models. So if data is the new oil, what incentivize us companies to put that data there so that everybody can use it for whichever purposes. And it kind of cuts the line from us to a healthcare provider because how would the healthcare provider then reward us 
what's the purpose for us or what's the basis for us to send invoices to them. So we still have lots of work to do there. Next step for us, integrating with the healthcare providers. So as Anna mentioned, there's still some fuss, some details to be sorted out before you can get the data from the Kanta PHR to actually a physician's desktop. And for us in SensorTrend, we are quite ready to expand to other markets. We are looking for MedMay, for instance, like to do a project there or in Australia because there's also a PHR platform quite close to what we have been doing. And then for the Night Scouts part, going international as well. Uh, our code, most of that is open source in our GitHub repository. Take pictures. And then finally, some words of other fi fire use cases in Finland. So one that might be of wide interest is scheduling. There's one EHR system, CGIs in Finland, that uses fire scheduling API as their native scheduling API. And then there are two projects that have been doing adapters for other and older EHR systems so that their interfaces would also be opened as fire interfaces. And there are Timo and Antti on that table. I'm trying to push them to have a session on that tomorrow. They haven't committed yet. Are you now committed? <laughs> they're not committed yet, <laughs> but we'll hope that they'll give a session on, on that tomorrow. So they're working on a product that integrates with all of these systems and exposing the fire scheduling interface. And there has been activity with the international patient su summary and doing fire aspects of that. None of us have been involved, so no details available, unfortunately. And then one final thing, all of the EHRs in Finland are in the end of their life cycle, apart from the newest one that's EPIC, that Huda mentioned in her keynotes, the 700 million project. So that's one EPIC installation in Finland, that's new one. But all the other ones are in the end of their life cycle. And now we're looking for replacements to those and all the competitions, all the processes I've seen in that are requiring the new EHRs to have fire interfaces. So it's good times for us app developers quite soon in five or six years when they've actually taken those systems into use. And that's the presentation and Thank you, and happy to take questions. I was wondering, do you have cases where you have used the big um, applications you show, the patients, would they get to use a home doctor and just press it? Yes. So our point is that you use the same data, so for the patient and for the practitioner. And currently, you can do it with SensorTrend's own service, but currently, with, from the, natively from the Kanta PHR service, not yet, because there are some legal constraints. Y yes, or we're still pending on legislation to come into force before, before we can implement that part. But hopefully, next year, we'll be actually implementing it and hopefully um, starting first pilots. And once you start rolling out, if you exit through here, you can take some finished chocolate with you. Okay, so the uh, authorization part is based on OS 2.0, so that's what we're using. And, and uh, for strong authentication in Finland, we have these um, uh, national ones that are not developed by my, organi my organization, but a different one. I don't remember the English name for Vestregistre Keskus, but that's what it is. Um, uh, and what we use, and, and then we have this um, suomi.fi service through which uh, the strong authentication goes through, um, which is the Vergo <laughs> company who's doing that. And we have uh, banking uh, credentials or IDs with which, which you can strongly authenticate. Then the, there's mobile 
mobiilivarmenne, what's that in English, do you remember? Yeah, the same for mobile operators that provide yeah. strong authentication. Yeah, so that's one. And um, we have a like national that. ID that's shared across everything, so we don't have that matching problem, so we can find yeah. it. Uh, they can choose, uh, but yeah, like Mikhail said, the social security number is. is uh, um, so these are all different all services. This. There's this. That's a hardware card that you can use. That's the mobile operators. All of them have the same stuff, and then these rest of our banks. So they have different systems, but all, uh, all going through open ID. Well, well, what we we have to see, but, but because we know that fire, there will be R four, R six, and so forth, we don't want to uh, sort of support the older versions anymore. So that's what we're trying to do. And and with the transition period, we're trying to um, enable the apps that have integrated to the platform to actually uh, build R four support at their own own pace. And and then at some point, we have to set a date, and and hopefully, everybody will. If you're considering the effort required to do that, that's where the strict profiling actually helps because the amount of data that has been fed through the STU3 interface is quite limited. So it's been really strict. You can only store this and this data and not much of that changes to R4. So okay. seems plausible that they can pull it off. Yeah, From app provider's <laughs> point of view, no need to do that. We can switch to R4 and <laughs> Yeah, but of but course, the le legacy data is good to get. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Exit this way, get finished shortly. Thank you. <laughs>